and I'll tell you something else I heard. Now think about this. Because at one time, science said man came from apes. Did it not? I've read, I, you know, to I, every, I, every time I read or hear that, I think to myself, you just didn't read the same Bible I did. Well, well this was interesting, though. If that is true, why are there still apes? Think about it. You know, now you're getting too smart for it. No, 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 no. Yeah. So that guy's running for Senate, and he's been endorsed by Donald Trump, so he's probably going to get a pretty good turnout when Election Day rolls around. And you just watched him ask the most easy, basic question that you could possibly ask about evolution as if it were some sort of big gotcha moment. Now, this video is not just to try to mock or make fun of Herschel Walker. In fact, this video isn't really even about just him at all, because after all, we're all ignorant of something, right? There's no shame in just being ignorant about a thing. I'm pretty sure he played football before this. What reason would he have had to learn biology up till this point? So this sucks, but it's kind of understandable, right? The point of this video is to draw attention to the fact that there are certain things that it should be unacceptable for somebody to be that ignorant about if they want to hold public office. And I think it should be pretty obvious that science is one of those things. Like, what if he got on stage and spoke at that level about economics? What if he said, I had one dollar, but I traded it for two quarters, and two is more than one, so now I have more money? No matter what else he said, no matter who he was running against, would you continue to take him seriously? Would you then ask him about his tax plans? Or would you just say, all right, dude, you seem really nice, but this kind of proves to me that you are not ready for the level of responsibility and authority that you're asking for. Sorry, I can't vote for you. What if he spoke at that level about geography? What if you asked him about Ukraine? And he said, oh yeah, Ukraine, that's, that's right next to Australia, right? Would you then talk about his strong moral compass and his border security ideas? Or would you say, all right, dude, sorry, that proves to me that you are not fit for office. See you next time. Maybe try again. So as important as economics and geography are for a politician to understand, science is more important. Because without science, we have nothing. We don't have clean food. We don't have clean water. We don't have infrastructure of any kind. No cars, no roads, no bridges, no nothing. We don't have a military. We can't tackle climate change. We can't stop the pandemic. We have nothing without science. So when someone is showing you that they have less than a middle school understanding of basic science, why would you then listen to them when they try to tell you that they can run a country efficiently, no matter what else they have to say? Like, I don't think this is a super elitist thing or even a very partisan thing. I wouldn't trust a mechanic who doesn't know how cars work. So why would I trust a politician who doesn't know how reality works? Food for thought. Fun fact, there are more bacteria inside one human mouth then there are humans in the whole world. You know, now I think about it, that fact is not fun. Come along on a journey with me because I just got a lot of really weird comments. This person made all of these comments on my video about menstruation. He commented 10 times, not in a thread, all separately, starting with a number. And he starts off by saying that the video is awesome. Thank you very much. And that it's a perfect segue to prove God and disprove evolution. Now, right away, this is a problem. Because as I've said several times before, this is an example of the either-or fallacy. Even if you could disprove evolution, that does nothing to back up the new hypothesis that you're asserting. You need other evidence to support that. But whatever, let's hear what he has to say. Males and females are two halves of one reproductive system, which one evolved first? Now you might be thinking, what exactly do you mean by which one evolved first? Don't worry, he does elaborate. How did they reproduce while waiting for the other one to evolve? Or did two halves of one system evolve together in the same lifetime, separate parts randomly evolved, and somehow still fitting together perfectly? And of course, the fundamental misunderstanding that this commenter has is that populations evolve. Individuals do not evolve. There was not one human who evolved one day and then just had to wait around for the other humans to come around. Humans evolved, all able to reproduce together. Then he shows another misunderstanding when he asks, it happened multiple times with cats and dogs and bears where only the male can reproduce with the female. So how did this keep evolving this way? But sexual reproduction is not a new thing. It's been around for at least 1.2 billion years. So we had an ancestor that reproduced sexually, and now we all reproduce sexually 
because we inherited that characteristic. It's sort of like pentadactyly. Humans and chimpanzees and lizards and bats and whales all have five fingers because we had an ancestor that had five fingers around 400 million years ago, and we all inherited it. So it's not like every new species has to figure out how to have sex. His thesis continues with the assertion that the only possible explanation for this is that we were all created by God as is. I can think of several better explanations off the top of my head, but go off, I guess. Then he says that evolution is not observable or repeatable science. Yes, it very much is. And by the way, when was the last time that you observed a human being created out of dust or a rib? Then he says that evolution claims that all life came from a lifeless rock. Evolution makes no such claim. And if perhaps you think that I'm being a little bit too harsh or condescending in my rebuttal here, I'd like to point out that he absolutely just can't help himself but to end the whole thread with a threat. Please rethink your atheism. Time is running out. Referring here to the eternal torture that this person thinks that I deserve because I don't believe the same things that he believes. It turns out 10 TikTok comments didn't revolutionize science. So I found this nightmare cube. And here on the front is an image of an old woman who is about to ensnare a child then on this side you've got the goat mother leading her brood on the back is a young girl eating some birds i guess this side uh, shows an image of a lovely young woman surrounded by doting old men and then uh, here on the top is this creature who is about to be consumed by a hound and just when you think it can't get any creepier, you just pull this little knob here and, uh... Oh my god, it gets worse. One of my favorite concepts to think about in sociology and anthropology is doxa. The doxa is the unspoken, unchallenged set of rules that we all live under every single day. It's the way in which you navigate your society without even thinking about it. It's the combined force of all of our habits acting together. For example, consider going to a concert. Where would you like to sit? Would you rather sit right up near the front where you can see the stage or way back in the back where there's a little bit more breathing room? Would you sit off to the sides where the seats are cheaper or maybe up in the balcony where there's a way better view? You can think about this as long as you like, but there's a really, really good chance that you won't answer, I want to sit right up on stage where the performer is. Because even though that would be an undeniably radical experience, that's not allowed. That's outside of the rules of the game that we're all playing called society. Even though that is technically a possibility, you wouldn't even think about thinking about that on any normal day. Because it's outside of the doxa. And once you start seeing these boundary lines, you'll start noticing them everywhere. And then you'll start noticing the ideas that lie outside of those boundary lines. And you might just start to think that not all of those ideas are bad. This is why I always encourage people to challenge their most deeply held, their most sacred ideas. Because if they are really good ideas, they will stand up to scrutiny. And if they can't stand up to scrutiny, you might just be better off without them. Because when doxa isn't challenged every now and then, it can become a sort of dogma. Those heuristics, those mental pathways that we build throughout our lives, become shackles that weigh us down and stop us from exploring other possibilities. If you want to start small, though, I encourage you just to go find some weird stuff. Explore some absurdist art, or listen to some experimental music, or just go to YouTube and watch important videos. Or, my favorite... Find some meaningless and trivial things that evoke visceral reactions in people. These are all great and diverse ways to just get you to think outside the dock. 